Whether or not we like it, the hack shack strategy is alive and well in the NBA. In this video, we're going to dive into some of the mathematics that go behind why the strategy works and talk about why hack shack is a perfect representation of how analytics and basketball wisdom can combine to be used to form an effective strategy. What's up guys, my name is Mark. Strap up your seatbelts because this video is about to get real complicated real fast. But we are going to start with something simple. So let's first take a simplified look at some of the mathematics behind hack shack I think most people watching right now know what points per possession is. It's how many points a team scores per possession, which is what determines offensive rating and it's fundamentally the best and quite frankly the only way to determine how efficient an offense is. Now conversely on the other side, how many points you give up per possession is how we can measure how efficient our defense is otherwise known as defensive rating. And this is where we come to hack a shack a defensive strategy. So to illustrate this point, let's use an example, Clippers versus Spurs. DeAndre Jordan, as we all know, has been a consistent victim of the strategy for the past couple seasons. The Clippers offensive rating last season was 112, otherwise known as 1.12 points per possession. When the Spurs hacked DeAndre Jordan, they put him on the line two times. DeAndre Jordan shot 48.2% last year. So if we convert that into points per possession based on two free throws, that would be 0.964 points per possession. As you can see, that's a significantly lower offensive rating than the Clippers average offensive rating. In fact, 0.964 points per possession would easily be by far the best defensive rating in the league if it were stretched out for 48 minutes. Now, people talk a lot about DeAndre Jordan just needs to shoot blank percent from the free throw line. Well, if we use the Clippers average offensive rating as the guideline, DeAndre Jordan would then theoretically have to shoot roughly 16.6% .6 from the free throw line for it to be statistically disadvantageous for the Spurs to hack him. But like I said in the beginning, the hack a shack strategy is much more complicated than this because there are other factors we have to think about as well. Unfortunately, choosing whether or not to hack a player isn't a simple comparison between that player's free throw percentage and his team's offensive rating. First off, when you employ hack a shack, your team basically loses all fast break opportunities because you're intentionally putting someone on the line, which means the opposing team is guaranteed to have two players back in their own half court, which basically eliminates the chance for a fast break to happen off of a made or missed free throw. And it's both common sense and proven by statistics that fast break is much more efficient and rewarding than playing in half court. Now, ideally, we would take the exact amount of fast break possessions, the fast break efficiency, and factor that into a team's offensive rating without the fast break opportunity. In other words, their half court efficiency, which theoretically would be a lower mark than their original offensive rating that included fast breaks. But the problem here mainly lies in our inability to quantify fast breaks. NBA.com has a play type category called transition. Now, to my knowledge, the NBA doesn't exactly publicate how they measure transition. So theoretically, it wouldn't be fair for me to criticize how they measure transition. But all I'm going to say is that I believe transition is more of a spectrum thing. So in other words, I believe it's impossible for us to just draw a line and say everything above this should be considered transition and everything below this is half court. Hopefully that makes sense. I, I just don't think it's something we can quantifiably and definitively factor into a potential calculation especially when we're dealing with pretty small numbers like 0.01 points per possession, which for some teams, according to NBA.com, is the difference between their half court efficiency and their quote transition efficiency. The key part is that transition matters. If for some teams like the Warriors and the Suns, it really matters because they like playing in transition. Some other teams like the Spurs and the Grizzlies, it doesn't matter nearly as much because they play a lot less transition. So transition is one thing. You also have to factor in offensive rebounding because when a player misses his second free throw, that's a potential offensive rebound for the other team. The league average offensive rebounding rate off of missed free throws varies between 10 and 12% every season. And when the opposing team gets an offensive rebound, that's an entirely new possession and often an easy bucket because they're right at the rim. Statistics tell us that when a player gets the offensive rebound and kicks it out, it basically turns into an average possession, but when he gets the rebound and immediately goes up with it, it's a shot that goes in 51% of the time, which is higher than the average for just a normal shot. But let's take this a step further because this is where I think some people get confused. We know that missed free throws get rebounded by the offense 11% of the time, but in general for a normal possession, the ball actually gets rebounded by the offense roughly 30% of the time. 
So hacking someone actually decreases the chance of the possession ending up being renewed by the offense, which makes intuitive sense because it's harder to get an offensive rebound when you're at a naturally disadvantageous position. It's also worth noting that most players who get hacked are centers, and centers are quite often the best rebounder on the team. So on average, Hackershack offensive rebounding rates should theoretically be lower than the offensive rebounding rates of a normal free throw of a non-center. Now, when we're actually applying these theories to an NBA game, sometimes these factors don't really matter as much. For example, Roberson shot three of 21 against Houston in the first round of the playoffs last year. When I'm talking about quantifying transition and offensive rebounding, it's mostly to do with players that are kind of at the brink of being a bad enough free throw shooter to be hacked. A good example is Dwight Howard, who hovers around 49 to 53% free throw shooting season to season, who actually has one of the higher free throw percentages out of players who get hacked normally. But when you're shooting three of 21, which was what Roberson shot in the series against Houston, there is no need to think about the effects of hack a shack on transition and rebounding and stuff. When you're that bad, like three of 21 bad, you hack. Similarly, when Drummond is missing 70% or 80% of his free throws within a single game, if he's 2 of 9, 3 of 12, you should continue to hack until Drummond at least becomes decently bad enough to where you would even debate it. And in fact, that's the strategy most teams adapt. It's just to continue hacking Andre Drummond until he reaches the 40-45% mark. Now finally, the third big component that makes hack a a complicated process is momentum. I've personally always been fascinated by momentum, not just in basketball, in sports in general. Over the years, I've scoured the internet looking for research articles done on momentum in sports. So back in 2014, Jose Martinez and Jeremy Arcs of the Naval Postgraduate Academy published a research article that showed how teams statistically perform better when they're on winning streaks. But to my knowledge, there has never been a convincing or complete study done on momentum effects within a single game. But I think 99% of basketball fans who watch the NBA would agree that momentum effects definitely occur within, the, within a single game. Sometimes all it takes is just one player making a couple shots in a row for the whole team to kind of get going offensively. Sometimes it's just one really emphatic block that leads to a transition bucket, which kind of energizes the whole team. It, it sounds a bit cliche and I tend to try to avoid it, but I do agree. Like stuff like that does play a role in terms of momentum in a game and momentum does have a tangible effect on how a team performs. And perhaps more so than the statistical advantage hack a shack gives you by definitively lowering the opponent's offensive rating when you put a poor free throw shooter on the line, hack a shack is really great at stopping momentum. When a team like the Clippers started getting hot, when Redick was hitting threes, or Jamal Crawford, who's a very streaky player, started going on a hot streak, making shots, it made a lot of sense to hack DeAndre, which is also the most effective way to prevent one of his teammates from being an effective offensive player. And by doing so for players like Redick and Crawford, whose contributions on the offensive end are much more valuable than their contributions, or should I say non-contributions on the defensive end, you can really limit the overall production of the opposing team. What goes hand in hand with momentum is also rhythm. Another somewhat abstract concept in basketball that has never been properly measured, but without a doubt exists. And while I do think that there are some smart people, people much smarter than me, who could probably do some studies that statistically prove momentum exists within a game, I'm not completely sure that there will ever be a good way to statistically measure a player's rhythm. If we're defining a player's rhythm as sort of how comfortable a player feels within a game. Obviously, for a player to be at maximum effectiveness, you'd want to keep that player as refreshed as possible but you'd also want them to be engaged, especially offensively. For example, when a player is not involved in the offense, if for two or three straight possessions, he doesn't get to touch the ball, it'd probably mess with his rhythm. And I think it's why we see so many teams struggle having multiple ball dominant players. It's because certain players just need the ball in their hands to be effective. And if there are stretches during the game where they don't have the ball, it seeps to the other aspects of their game. I think what best illustrates this point is one of Luke Walton's comments on Julius Randle. So he was being interviewed by Zach Lowe, and I'm paraphrasing here because unfortunately I can't find the exact quote, but what he said is basically, when Julius Randle is given the ball, dribbling it and making passes, he plays a lot better on defense. And the only thing that can really explain Walton's comments is something along the lines of rhythm. So for example, if Luke Walton's observations on his own player are correct, and let's say Randall was playing with a bad free throw shooter, then whenever Randall got into a groove offensively, you could immediately disrupt that by hacking the bad free throw shooter, which would potentially lower Randall's effectiveness on defense. 
And related to that, when a poor free throw shooter is at the line and is missing free throws, it messes with their confidence to a certain degree. And again, at this point, we're kind of taking a step further back away from statistics and analytics because God knows we cannot quantify confidence. But I don't think anyone would object to the statement that lower confidence generally leads to lower effectiveness. So like we've talked about so far, hack -a shack might seem simple on paper when you take the offensive rating of a team and compare that to a poor free throw shooter's offensive rating at the line. But when you consider fast break, momentum, rhythm, and offensive rebounding, it could get really, really complicated. And something like hack -a shack is also a good representation for how we can apply analytics to basketball in real life. It's important to recognize that almost every statistical judgment needs to be paired with some degree of human judgment for it to be applicable to reality. For example, Simple analytics might tell you that DeAndre Jordan needs to shoot 60.6% from the free throw line for him not to be quote unquote hacked anymore. Advanced analytics might be able to tell you that after factoring offensive rebounding and fast breaks in transition, you'd probably need to tweak that number a little higher or a little lower to get an exact number. But momentum tells you that there will always be non-quantifiable factors in your decision of whether or not to employ a specific basketball strategy. And it's these non-quantifiable factors that turn hack -a shack from just a calculation into a bit of an art form as well. So in other words, it requires subjective judgment. And that's why I'm not surprised that the best coach in the league also happens to be the best coach at employing this hack -a shack strategy. Where I think some old school or traditional NBA analysts or fans get really offended by this analytics revolution that has occurred over the past eight years is that they think that analytical people think that analytics solves everything. Whereas nobody who's ever taken the time to study analytics and listen to people who study analytics has ever claimed that to be true. Even Daryl Morey, who's considered to be the face of NBA analytics, has acknowledged that some of the big decisions he has to make for the franchise, like who to draft, who to sign, sometimes still depends a lot on just his eye test observation of that player. Analytics is a tool that helps us make better decisions. Year by year, it improves the decision making of teams who choose to invest to it. Because year by year, it takes a little bit more of the guesswork out of the equation. But when you're dealing with a sport like basketball, which is arguably played just as much mentally as it is physically, there will always be room for human judgment and the quote unquote eye test to that everyone, including analytics people, uses in their analysis of players. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. Before I end the video, I just want to give a massive shout out to Vertigear for sponsoring this video. No joke guys, this is the most comfortable thing I've ever placed my ass on. <laughs> That's, that sounds weird. <laughs> this is the most comfortable thing I've ever sat on. For an NBA fan like me who spends a lot of time sitting down at a desk, on a chair, watching NBA League Pass, or watching NBA League Pass, that's really, that's, that's really all I watch. Investing in a good chair is important. I'll leave a link to Vertigear and all the chairs that they sell on their website in the description below. They offered you guys a special promo code, just insert MDJ at checkout and you'll get 5% off of your chair. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, subscribe to the channel if you're not already. I mean, come on, what are you doing? Subscribe to the channel, subscribe to the channel. Other than that, thanks for watching. I'm MDJ and I'll see you next time.